Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of ASGA podcast, the EU Spectator, where we delve into the most pressing political developments and their global implications. Today, we're exploring a fascinating and highly significant scenario, uh, Kamala Harris winning the US presidential election and the potential impacts on her presidency. I am uh, thrilled to have with us a distinguished guest, uh, Nick Zalewski, uh, an expert on political and political analyst on transatlantic relations and European affairs. Nick brings a wealth of knowledge and insights into the US politics because uh, he is a US citizen and it's in uh, his intersection with the European affairs, it's uh, highly qualitative. Together, we will uh, unpack with a Harris administration could mean for um, what a Harris administration could mean for the US, uh, Europe, and the world at large. Uh, please stay tuned for a learning discussion. Nick, welcome back to, to our podcast. Thanks for having me and everyone make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel and comment with your opinions, whether or not you agree or disagree with what I'm saying. Uh, if you agree with what I'm saying, put uh, an American Eagle emoji in the comment. <laughs> <laughs> and if not, put the skull face. Right. So today's discussion uh, centers on a pivotal moment in American politics, uh, President Joe Biden's decision to end his uh, his re-election campaign, paving the way for Vice President Kamala Harris to uh, to lay the Democratic ticket. Uh, this strategic move has, uh, has injected a sense of renewed uh, optimism and vigor with, within the Democratic Party, as Harris' candidacy offers uh, a fresh opportunity to, to retain the White House. Uh, her leadership and dynamic uh, dynamic uh, presence have already begun to uh, to polarize the party's base, fostering hope and um, uh, excitement for for the upcoming election cycle. However, Nick, this shift at the top uh, has also um, sparked a wave of uncertainty among White House staffers. While the, uh, the broader party uh, celebrates the potential of Harris uh, presidency, those working closely with the administration face um, a, a different reality. Many staffers are quietly um, un un uneasy, not necessarily uh, doubting Harris' ability to 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 be both rather concerning about their own uh, their own future. Uh, this sense is not. Uncommon during such significant political uh, transitions, staffers who have dedicated their efforts to President Biden's agenda may find themselves uh, navigating new rules or even seeking opportunities outside the uh, the current uh, administration. As we explore the potential impacts of Kamala Harris becoming the next U.S. president, I think it's crucial to consider uh, to consider this internal dy dynamics alongside the larger political landscape. Uh, so how will Harris leadership style and, and policy priorities uh, reshape the, the administration? It's almost hard to tell because she doesn't have much of a record at all for us to really go on. And that's what a lot of people you know, don't like to talk about. And that's why a lot of people are very skeptic of all this enthusiasm all of a sudden for Harris, because she's basically known for cackling when she gets nervous and can't answer a question. I mean, she will always forever remain famous in my mind for her interview with the, uh, with the journalist Lester Holt when she's asked okay, when are you going to go to the border? Because, by the way, mainstream media... We never forget, uh, mainstream American media cannot lie like they're trying to now. Mm -hmm. She was nominated border czar. She was supposed to work on the border as vice president, as reported by mainstream media back then. But now because she did a horrible job, basically did nothing, they want to pretend she wasn't. But back to the interview, never will forget in the interview how he asked, well, when are you going to go visit the border since she's allegedly supposed to be over the border? 
<laughs> I've never been to Europe yet. And he looks at her like, oh, is this lady mentally stable? Why is she talking about Europe when we're talking about the border, which is her duty? And in case anybody forgets the timeline, this was well before the Ukraine war broke out. So there was no need for her to go to Europe then. There was no political, major political crisis. And yet she couldn't understand why she's being asked why she would visit the U.S. border, despite that already having become a crisis. And part of the problem was, was with Biden, how he kept on campaigning and encouraging people to illegally immigrate by saying, oh, well, if I win, you know, for the first hundred days, yeah, we're not really going to worry about uh, closing the border or whatever. So you had a huge rush of people. And this was angering Mexico because when this is supposed to be during the pandemic, when all these political leaders are saying, oh, well, people should limit contact with others, etc. There's President Biden encouraging people to rush their way into the United States. <laughs> which of course is upsetting Mexico because a lot of these immigrants are transiting through Mexico, increasing their risk of possibly getting sick if you have people from elsewhere bringing COVID and other things. And what also angers a lot of Americans and definitely angers me is when you have the government mm -hmm. insisting people get vaccinated uh, for the pandemic. These illegal immigrants were never forced to vaccinate. Neither for any of the other mandatory vaccines that Americans are able to get uh, are supposed to get in order to continue to go to school, etc., which angers people. OK. Why do we have this two tier system of, oh, well, if you're already illegal, breaking our immigration laws? Oh, yeah, you're also able to break our health laws and not get the mandatory vaccines. But it's also unclear with policy because. She says some things, but she hasn't done much. So, for example, since we're talking about policy, this brings into question one Senator Warren from Massachusetts was asked, oh, but well, what's Kamala Harris's biggest accomplishment? You know what this woman had the audacity to say? Oh, well, Kamala Harris is the first vice president to visit an abortion clinic. Okay, regardless of the viewer's attitude or thoughts on abortion. Even if you support abortion, how are you supposed to be impressed with this? She was vice right. president and she didn't try to even draft any policy into potentially a national law. Nothing. Oh, she visited a clinic. Really? This is Okay, what about the policy? She's a politician. She's supposed to uh, do more than just make a media appearance. But essentially, that's what it was. Oh, well, she went to a clinic. She took some pictures. Oh, wow. Such a great politician. But and then it also goes back to California. Yeah, um, the fact that uh, how when she was in power in California, how she was putting Black men in prison for weed one, she was trying to be cool when running for president in 2020. Oh, I smoked some pot too uh, in law school. And people realized about the timeline because she was trying to say, why well, listen to Snoop Dogg? And people said, really? He didn't li uh, release any music until you were in power, putting Black men away for the same thing. So to me, it's fake the uh, apparently Democrats have amnesia in the United States where they forget all of this. How are you going to forget that? Especially when people want to talk about oh, Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter. Well, apparently mm -hmm. Black Lives Matter until it's Kamala Harris putting Black men away for the same thing she's doing when she's in power. Because if she, which I got to admit, people are really questioning whether she ever really smoked weed or if she simply said this to attract the vote and make herself look cool because that's what it seems like a big part of her campaign is. Because okay. if you look, well, because it, it's a little scary where there was a video that came out of our generation's Gen Z showing in a club where they have 
some really cringy remix showing her face just randomly bouncing around the screen. And then you have all these Gen Z people, oh, that's my president. Based off of what has she done that we could say, oh yeah, we agree with her policy. She doesn't have much policy behind her. She really doesn't say much. It basically seems like when you see different articles written about her, people keep on trying to push the abortion issue, which I got to be honest with you. I don't know how strong of an issue that's going to be with her. Sure, that will be strong for some parts of the U.S., but it's important to reflect back on my time when I worked on a congressional campaign in 2020. It was shocking that back then, because there was no sign of the Supreme Court mm -hmm. uh, striking down Roe v. Wade. The fact that that was a conservative court, by the way, my mom uh, would like to get that information out there. The fact that Roe v. Wade was decided by a conservative court <laughs> uh, in the first place, when people try to say it was conservatives always against abortion, well... Roe v. Wade came about in the first place because of a conservative uh, Supreme Court ruling. Anyways, but with this congressional campaign, it was shocking to me and even shocking uh, to the campaign itself that when we would campaign, uh, especially in the early stages where we're reaching out to all households, regardless if uh, it shows based off of your voter registration records, you tend to vote for more. Mm -hmm. uh, Democrats or more Republicans, it was multiple liberal identifying women and their voting records indicated that they tend to vote for Democrats, almost screaming their heads off at me. Abortion's the most important issue. We can't allow it. These are supposed to be Democratic women who are against abortion. So when people try to put forth this issue, and I've seen a lot of media pundits saying, oh, yes, almost as if abortion is a path for Kamala Harris to win. I don't know if that's necessarily true because you have a lot of moderate Democrats or independents who aren't necessarily uh, supportive of abortion, especially one. It depends because as Europeans may be aware, uh, it's a little challenging in the U.S. because we don't have smaller political parties as in Europe where mm -hmm. For every small group of people where if you agree on a various core number of issues, okay, then you have your small political party. With the U.S., you either have left-leaning people, Democrats, right-leaning people, or Republicans. So a lot of Democrats not, aren't necessarily that unfavorable of some of the more extreme abortion legislation that sometimes to, uh, some Democrats promote because some Democrats are want to push legislation more like Europe mm -hmm. in the sense that, okay, let's allow abortion somewhere between 15 to 20 weeks, which would be in line with Europe. The fact that most European countries, it's between 12 to 20 weeks, the legislation. You then have some more extreme Democrats who are trying to say, no, no, up until the moment of birth, which is really extreme. And even based off of medical lit uh, literature, risky towards the life of the mother. Uh, right. That would be more of a situation almost where it's like, well, it's not necessarily an abortion. It should be more, okay, who are you prioritizing saving if you have to have the doctors focus on one individual, the mother or the child at that point, rather than calling it an abortion if something were to go wrong in birth. But... We don't really hear much legislation from her because the fact that she didn't do well as borders are, you don't really hear her talking about, you hear her a little, a little bit about because there was supposed to be a bipartisan legislation that she's trying to blame Trump for failing, but it was a horrendous bill because it would allow thousands of people to illegally come into the U.S. a day simply uh, possibly under the guise of pretending to apply for asylum, but not meeting the requirements. You know, we're not talking about, oh, we're going to allow 5,000 asylum seekers in a day, mm -hmm. but they have all their paperwork and stuff, or they, they at least have something to show us that, yes, there's a good chance they qualify, so we'll let them in. It's just, so of course, people have learned to play the game, and that's what Democrats don't want to acknowledge, the fact that 
people worldwide have realized that you could cross into the U.S. on the southern border without too much trouble. There's been articles published about how we have all this illegal immigration now from Mauritania in Africa. People are coming all the way from Mauritania through Mexico, illegally immigrating, and then making their way to Ohio. So when people want to try to say that, oh, the, these are le all legitimate asylum seekers. No, we're seeing a lot of Im uh, illegal immigration and we're not really seeing actual measures such as Poland or Finland saying, no, we're going to close the border if we have to. We're not going to allow all these people pouring into who are then going to expect all these free benefits. And that's what's going to be interesting to see with the DNC. I don't know if Europeans have heard necessarily, but Governor Abbott, the governor of Texas, has already stated that he's going to send thousands of illegal immigrants to the DNC in Chicago, uh, partially because it's the Democrats in states far from the U.S. border who love promoting open border. But then when you have politicians like Abbott, who in my mind are absolutely valid with then sending these illegal uh, immigrants to states that want to pretend, oh, well, we're, uh, uh, we're uh, open states. Uh, yes, we're refuge uh, states. We're not going to call ICE on them. Okay, then you can pay for them. Because a lot of states like and cities like Chicago, oh, well, we're open to migrants. We'll help pay for them. We'll give them this. We'll give them that. So talking about all the benefits. They never wanted to do this then because when you then had politicians like Abbott actually sending them, oh, how dare he? No, 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 no. You can't make these empty promises for campaigns. And then when Abbott forces you to keep your promises, then get angry at him. If, if uh, Democrat politicians want to advocate for an open border, then you could help pay for these migrants. If you, uh, you know, if you're OK, then you could pay for the schooling, for the housing, all this without the tax revenue then from them because they're not working. Yeah, but. In the light of all those things, what challenges and opportunities will arise for the Democratic Party as it relies behind uh, Kamala Harris' candidacy? The only uh, possible... The only possibility of Kamala Harris's winning is if she wins not based on facts, but based off of, as the young people call it, good vibes because she doesn't have uh, detailed plans. Okay. And that's the issue with her. But you, we're not hearing, well, what are you going to do with the increasing uh, immigration crisis, especially then when you have different uh, states like, or in cities, Chicago, New York City are really, uh, Denver, Colorado, they're struggling to pay for all these illegal immigrants because now they're being forced to keep these uh Promises and Kamala Harris isn't really coming out with, okay, yes, we're going to control the uh, secure the border, etc., which is pissing off a lot of Republicans, rightfully so, because when a figure was thrown out that it would cost ten billion dollars uh, to build a border wall between the U.S. and Mexico, the Democrats that's too much money. Now under Biden, we have sent Ukraine possibly upwards of $175 billion. And so as conservatives point out, which is angering a lot of Americans, so let me get this straight. We could spend $175 billion trying to secure the border with Ukraine, with Russia, but we can't secure our own border for less than 10% of the cost. Mm -hmm. And that's what's angering taxpayers, especially, which rightfully so, because different European nations are not living up to, the, to their duties. Germany, who wants to uh, criticize potentially Trump winning, Germany, put your money where your mouth is. You always want to brag about how you're the largest economy in the EU, how you're so much better than Italy and those lazy Southern uh, Europeans. But then when it comes to actually paying for stuff, oh, well, I I'm trying to remember what their contribution. It was something more like, what, 28 billion euros? That's nothing compared to what the U.S. has spent. The, uh, Germany should be spending far more when they want to keep on bragging. And Germany would be able to provide more if it was living up to its NATO obligations, which it wasn't. And that's what, and 
that's the one thing that Trump has a point with the fact that a lot of these European nations, which, by the way, we could give uh, compliments to Romania for living up to that obligation, mm -hmm. but nations like Germany would be able to help more with Ukraine if they had these various military weapons laying around because they were spending 2% of their GDP on defense, where they would have more ability to assist Ukraine than they do now because these countries for over a decade, because this was in, I thought it was around 2005 when it was agreed on the 2%. So now we're talking almost 20 years that these countries refused to abide by the number that they all agreed with. You know, this wasn't forced on them. It was all these NATO members saying, oh yeah, that makes sense. We should agree to that. But with uh, it almost seems that with Kamala Harris, with their big campaign, they're going to have to reach out with the good vibes towards young people and hope that they don't pay attention to the actual issues because they don't have significant uh, legislative plans. It's just more about, oh, well, we don't want to vote for the mean orange man, so let's vote mm -hmm. for Kamala because she's fun. She says uh, kooky things like, did you fall out of a coconut tree? This is, uh, I mean, come on, she's woefully unqualified. And then the fact, too, the fact that we also have to point out, in 2020, she was so unpopular. She was so behind in the polls. And what is interesting that when Democrats want to try to say that they're trying to save democracy from Trump, how are you trying to save democracy if Kamala Harris never officially ran in a caucus or primary in the 2020 or 2024 elections? It was simply decided that she would become the candidate after Joe Biden woefully failed in the debate. In the media, which hit for years his mental decline in order to help him win, all of a sudden admitted all at the same time, yeah, Biden can no longer be president. It's like, well, wait a minute. All these political pundits were writing the day before Biden is going to crush that stupid orange man in the debate. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the next day they all flip on him. And that's what is going to be dangerous for the Democrats is the fact that because mainstream media seems to be cheerleading too much for Democrats to the point that they're now lying. A lot of Americans are losing faith in media because America. part of the problem too is that Biden's poor performance honestly did shock a lot of Americans, because I'll be brutally honest with uh, people watching this podcast, my European friends living in Europe seem to be more aware of Biden's failings and public embarrassments than Americans because mainstream media did not want to show it. So every time Biden would call the wrong country, so for example, when he was at an environmental conference in uh, Cambodia, in thank Cambodia. you, Colombia. Sir, you're in Cambodia. Thank you, Colombia. And he repeatedly says Colombia and never says Cambodia. Those videos would have Europeans ridiculing him and saying, my gosh, is he a mush? He doesn't know where he is. Your Democrat Gen Z people, they never saw those videos because, oh, well, mainstream media doesn't show it. And then a lot of times TikTok, will yeah, be in different is, videos like that. Yeah, but is, is this still democracy? It's not democracy, and that's part of the issue, where when you have mainstream media essentially playing propaganda for some candidates over the other, it's like, how are you democracy anymore? Which, don't get me wrong, there are plenty of things to criticize Trump for that the media would be 100% right for, but they take it too far where it's clear that these journalists have a bias. And that's where we go down this wrong path of, well, how are we living in a democracy if now we're pushing this essentially propaganda pieces about how great Biden was, but then one, he finally couldn't avoid debating Trump any longer, and then we see him fall apart. And the same journalist who said for years, you crazy Republicans, you don't know what you're talking about. He's dumb. 
doing a great job. He is so sharp. I mean, come on, Ho uh, Homeland Security uh, Secretary uh, Mayorkas, how embarrassing. I, uh, you know, it would be great if Trump gets in and fires him because ha it's scary that this man is supposed to be securing the border. One, here he is lying so badly trying to say, Biden is so sharp. I am so afraid to go into briefings with him. He, you know, he's really intimidating. He knows what he's talking about. Really? He barely knows where he ever is. He did horrible in the debate. That's doing, uh, that's being sharp. It's mm -hmm. scary that this is who allegedly intimidates the people running our government right now. <laughs> this is who's intimidating. And it's not going to change under Kabbalah. And part of the issue is, is that with the fact too, regardless of the fact that nobody ever voted for her because she never officially ran in a caucus or primary, you know, maybe people wrote her name in, but it wasn't like she was an officially listed candidate where she was going to draw votes like Biden, Biden legitimately did uh, win the nomination in 2020. The other issue with her is that she suspended her campaign because of how badly she was doing in the polls. So I find a lot of this enthusiasm for her to be fake. It's very manufactured where a lot of this enthusiasm, quite honestly, must simply be based off of people simply hating Trump. So they'll vote for whoever it is if it's not him, which isn't a good strategy because we always need to evaluate the two candidates. And that's the issue that I'm finding a lot of young people are not evaluating uh, the candidates fairly, or now they're saying uh, goofy things because it's funny mm -hmm. that um, you now know you're... What? Uh, sorry, you know what? Yeah. I'm, I'm just thinking that I'm glad you mentioned uh, the, the Democratic support records for Harris in the past because... Uh, I'm thinking one of the most striking experts on Vice President Harris' succession to to the top of the Democratic tickets is the absence of a counter candidate within the the Democratic National Convention. Well, not only that, but the whole thing of her becoming Vice President is weird in the first place because I don't know if you ever forget, but mm -hmm. Kamala Harris essentially called Joe Biden a racist because, um. He allegedly voted against some integration bill while he yeah. was in the Senate as a senator for Delaware, yeah. which is what his position was for years. She essentially called him a, ra a racist. You know, she didn't officially, but she really suggested it where you could tell that's what she means when she talked about how, oh, well, I was a little girl and I was bused to school and you voted against that. Uh, when talking about integrating schools. So it was really bizarre that here she would make such a big claim against him. And then, yes, I get to be vice president. So it, it, it it's very bizarre. It's like, well, if he's that horrible that this is why you're trying to run against him for the presidency, why would you willingly work for him as vice president? Mm -hmm. Where it shows that she seems to be a very disingenuous person as well, where it's more about gaining the power rather than about doing what's right or actually being focused on what's best for the country because it's, you know, the whole, but also part of the issue is I don't know if we really would have had a strong candidate against her because a lot of the names that have been mentioned, such as Governor Pritzker of my home state, Illinois, Governor Pritzker mm -hmm. of Newsom, California, Governor Whitmer, Michigan, who, I'll be honest, their states are doing horribly right now in the United States. None, none of the three should be considered leading uh, <laughs> people to lead the country. But at the same time, too, the issue is all three of them look like they have their eye potentially on the White House. Yeah. So none of them want to be associated with a bad 2024 campaign because... All three of them realized that because the media was covering up Biden's gaps and what people need to understand that I'm not 
I'm not trying to be partisan. I am t- looking at this from an analytical approach. The issue with Biden was, was that he was being fed questions by the media ahead of time where it was caught repeatedly, uh, note cards in his hand or pieces of paper showing, you know, to call on this person. They're going to ask this question. This is unheard of. The media is supposed to be able to ask questions that are difficult to answer. And you might almost need to say, let me get back to you on that with an official statement. Mm -hmm. You know, they always, it was, Biden's whole presidency was very manufactured. So these three candidates who possibly could have been strong contenders against Kamala, if the media didn't cover for Biden for so long, Mm -hmm. It's too late because look at it. The fact that Americans vote in November and it's just now that uh, Kamala is now the candidate. So she doesn't even have a year to run. So, yeah, but a lot of these. She's, she's acting as a candidate. Well, yeah, that's the thing. The fact that, you know, she never really was officially nominated. And that's what different people have almost compared her to the communist. Chinese party. The fact that, okay, well, this is your nominee. Ooh, and everyone claps. Which essentially is the case for Kamala, because as people are trying to say, oh, well, it makes sense because she's vice president. So if anything ever did happen to Biden in office, well, she would step up. Yes, but that has never happened. Right. <laughs> this isn't the common thing, though, because if you yeah. look at a lot of Democrat presidents, their vice president did not automatically always become the nominee. Otherwise, you would have a lot more politicians always fighting to become vice president if it was the automatic pathway to becoming the nominee if the, if the president didn't run the next election. And that's right. not the case. A lot of vice presidents, they were vice president. That's it. They didn't run officially uh, for presidency then. Right. And also. Because, and let's, well, let's look at Obama. Okay. When people want to try to argue that that makes sense with um, Kamala Harris uh, bec- automatically becoming, well, she's vice president. Look at Obama. He won two terms. Uh, as In case pe- uh, European viewers aren't aware. You could only serve two ter- uh, terms as president. Mm-hmm. It's not like the parliamentary systems where you basically keep on running until you lose. Yeah. Uh, vote of confidence or the general election. Okay. Who became the uh, the Democrat nominee in uh, 2016? It wasn't Joe Biden, even though he was vice president. So according to this logic that people are trying to use now, it should have been Joe Biden because, well, he's vice president. So Mm -hmm. since Obama uh, reached his term limit, okay, then it should go to Joe. No, it went to Hillary Clinton, who never served as vice president for Obama. So, you know, people just keep on making all the excuses they want for the Democrat Party because they don't like aspects of Trump. And it's like, but you could do two things at once. And that's the scary thing that people aren't saying, you know, hey, I don't like Trump. I do prefer Harris for whatever reason, but at the same time, let me criticize the Democratic Party so this never happens again. Instead, you're having a lot of Democrat voters, oh, it is what it is. No, it isn't, it is what it is. Because this is a scary president to set for either side because right now we're going to have both political parties, potentially the future just okay, this is our candidate. We're not even going to let voters decide. Yeah, People want to talk about declining democracy. This is declining democracy already. And and, and also, I think that the lack of of a primary challenge can be uh, can be seen as uh, I don't know uh, a missed opportunity for for a robust debate and uh, and 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 a throat uh, a vetting of the candidate who who may become the next president of the United States in a vibrant uh, I I can remember the the, the vibrant democracy uh, during the past year the past years in the in the Democratic Party and this this vibrant democracy the uh, the, the presence of a multiple candidates often ensure that um, a diverse uh, viewpoints are considered, and the best ideas came uh, came to the to the uh, forefront. But 
uh, well, I gotta be honest though. I do, I, I do agree with that usually. And that still luckily seems to be the case somewhat in Europe, but unfortunately it seems to be that it has rapidly become a popularity con uh, contest where even if you do have a lot of candidates, because Trump was the most well-known person on the side of the Republicans, okay, he becomes a candidate. And then with Joe Biden being a much more no name than some of the other candidates, okay, then let's just vote for him where I right. got to admit. And I do have to criticize my compatriots a little and say, we need to, we do need to honestly listen to the debates more rather than just going with, well, who's more popular possibly? It's like, who cares? Focus on the policy because, as you know, with Europe, a lot of different political leaders in Europe, they weren't necessarily well known before political debates, but it was based off of voters saying, yes, I agree with um, them on most of the issues. I'll vote for them. It wasn't, oh, well, they were more well known than others. So let me just vote for them. Yeah, and that's the issue. It is essential to, 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 to underline that for, for political parties, even if you are talking about Democratic parties or yeah. about Republicans, uh, it's, it's, it's essential for, for the party to not only embrace democratic principles, but also to, to demonstrate them in, in, in practice, showing that their, their candidates are, are chosen um, through open and competitive process. But Nick, given, given all those concerns, uh, I'd like to ask you, what are the potential risks for, for the Democratic Party in, in, in presenting a single candidate without a primary challenge? It's a, it's, that's a dangerous president where it's going to be concerning whether they're simply going to put forth uh, candidates all the time now mm -hmm. without really considering what voters want, which if we're being brutally honest, a lot of people feel that the Democrat Party essentially forced its way in uh, with uh, Bernie Sanders in the past, where okay. they where people feel a lot of pressure was put on Bernie Sanders, and that even though he potentially could have become the uh, the nominee, he never did because uh, other Democrats more near the top didn't necessarily like him. So it seemed that. The Democrat Party did everything it could to stop him, which, again, kind of begs the differ of, well, how is this democracy if you're not going to allow for any candidate to win and say, OK, we'll go with the candidate who wins the public vote because it's the will of the people. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's, the, you know, it's the irony, the fact that the U.S. Uh, Constitution starts with we the people. Okay. And... Now you're going to have it where the Democrat Party keeps on playing interference with who gets to be the presidential nominee. And it seems that we're heading down this dangerous path that this is, behavior is going to continue. And it just really shouldn't be. And then it's also dangerous, too, that we're starting to see that media coverage is also increasingly biased with the fact that, uh, for example, when you've now had two members of the squad, yeah, the ultra far left uh, progressives <laughs> in the U.S. House, two already lost Cory Bush and then Jamal Brown, one from oh. New York, one from Missouri. Missouri, oh. And the attitude was, well, he lost because of uh, those uh, Jews donating too much money through APEC. And it's like, excuse me? Why are we now accepting anti-Semitic uh, attacks to, tr uh, to downplay the success of the candidates and focusing all on the money one Democrats are known for pouring money into races where they don't even live. If we look at the mayor of Chicago, former mayor Rahm Emanuel, who conveniently actually w was Jewish, which is still Jewish, doesn't matter his faith, because his brother works in Hollywood, he was getting a lot of money from people in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to talk about how 
that doesn't seem like democracy pouring money into the Chicago mayor election to try to influence the election from Hollywood. And that's the issue that the Democratic Party has to confront, which now the Republicans seem to be following it, where people will donate to different political campaigns all across the country, even if it's not where they live, which I do think is a dangerous president. And I do almost agree that that shouldn't be legally allowed. If you can't vote for the candidate, why are we allowing you to try to buy the election then? But that's what we see with the Democrats time and time again. So, for example, uh, you know, I'm not going to defend him because another politician who's been doing uh, horrible due to old age, Mitch McConnell, with the Senate, senator from Kentucky. You have the Democrats flooding Kentucky with all this money trying to get a Democrat elected. The Democrat a candidate, if I'm not mistaken, outraised him, but still obviously lost because Kentucky is a very red state. But it's kind of concerning that the media never criticized that. But now they're going to try to criticize candidates when far left members of Congress lose. Oh, how dare those Jews donate money? Trying to blame all the success on APAC. And it's like, and that's the other issue that the Democratic Party is going to have because the Democratic Party seems to be really adopting an anti-Jewish stance. Yeah. <laughs> and it does, and I agree when it's like, well, okay, why hasn't the media ever criticized flooding different elections with money before unless they can blame the Jews, such as the races I mentioned? mayor of Chicago, senator in Kentucky. We're having different races where you're almost seeing election interference. And I don't know. I think part of the issue is, is that we might need to have stricter election rules like Europe. The fact that a lot in a lot of European countries, as you know, there's more of a time limit. While in the U.S., you could essentially be elected the day after, okay, I'm starting my re-election campaign. Excuse you, do your job that you were elected to do. Don't worry about the election now. Yeah, and where we should limit it, where we should possibly limit campaigns much more than almost essentially allowing people to start campaigning from day uh, the day after the election. Right. Uh, but, yeah, but as the as the twenty twenty four presidential race heads up, the the, the prospect of uh, a Trump Harris confrontation uh, promises to be one one of the most uh, intense and closely watched battles in the recent yes. US political history. And um, I'd like to 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 discuss a little bit about this because the debate between uh, these two uh, two figures are likely to be charged with with with, with constructing uh, visions for the future of the country. Harris, for example, has chosen Minnesota Governor uh, Tim Walz as her running mate, brings a, um, a combination of uh, a short political um, acumen and an, an ability to, to, to connect with, uh, with a diverse electorate. And um, I should recognize Waltz. No, it, it, it's known for his uh, a fabled uh, uh, demnor and a knack for 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 uh, delivering rhetorical uh, jabs at Donald Trump without without coming off um, uh, as um, I don't know overly aggressive. Uh, okay, but I gotta be honest with you. I think you're being a little generous because I'll be brutally honest with you. Yeah, please. Most Americans, before he was chosen, most Americans had no idea who Tim Waltz is. And I don't, you know, of course, you're going to have people try to say, oh, that's not true. It absolutely is true. Because when I'm campaigning, most of the people don't necessarily even realize who represents them. But they're going to know who the okay. governor of Minnesota is, a state that doesn't even have two, uh, you know, a little less than 2% of the U.S. population. It's a it's a small state by population. Yeah, right. So most Americans did not they woke up not knowing who this man was. Yeah, and part of the issue is people are pointing out he he was not very effective in Minnesota. The fact that he allowed the BLM riots to go on for so long, people to burn down uh the cities in 
Minneapolis. And then his bizarre wife, where she doesn't help him, where, you know, and that's the thing that I do notice in Europe doesn't necessarily gain as much attraction, where it seems to be more of an American thing, mm -hmm. where people will criticize the spouses more in the U.S. than they will in election campaigns, maybe apart from France, where people are trying to allege that Bridget took advantage of Macron, but, you know, nobody uh, necessarily has strong evidence. And if he's saying it's not, well, okay, you know, let's put that aside. Let's not get into that. But she had a very bizarre quote where <laughs> instead of her emphasizing and saying, hey, you need to crack down as governor on the violence, you can absolutely allow people to peacefully protest because, you know, similar to uh, with Italy, similar to a lot of parts in Europe, all you have to do is apply for a permit if you want to do different things, such as temporarily closing the streets off. And you're allowed because that is part of your right as a citizen. And instead of her saying, hey, we need to defend these peaceful protesters, but crack down on the criminals who are burning and harming others. She There's this bizarre video that I encourage people to look for where she talks about how, oh, well, it was such an historic moment. So she left her open her windows open for as long as she could so she could smell the burning rubber of tires. Okay. So this is who's going to be the uh, uh the first uh uh the wife of the potential vice president. I, I I that this isn't very supportive of the vice president and the fact that him as governor failed to crack down on rioters. I don't have much faith in him and but to be fair, this goes back to the issue of there weren't many candidates. Different mm -hmm. candidates will pretend that they were running like uh, Governor Pritzker, but I don't necessarily believe that they were all that thrilled with it. I, you know, Governor Pritzker never came out and said it, so this is just my speculation to make it clear for any legal purposes so we can't be held responsible. But in my opinion, Governor Pritzker, Governor Newsom, Governor Whitmer, all three of those governors want the presidency. So they want to be able to have a clean run in 2028 rather than coming at the last minute and be like, oh, look at me, I'm vice president. Let's now hit the ground running. Because <laughs> they have so many issues to get together in their states. So, for example, with Newsom, the fact that all of a sudden he's now cleaning up the homeless encampments, which was pissing people off because what did he do this for when Xi Jinping from China visited San Francisco? Mm -hmm. While you're having Californians who sometimes are, t are t uh, you know, too accepting for their own good, where it's one thing to say, hey, we understand these people need help or whatever, but at the same time, a lot of Californians were getting upset saying it's getting dangerous on the street because you're having people addicted to uh, injecting themselves on the street in public, potentially getting violent, robbing people for money and saying, well, come on, we have to help these people somehow, leaving them on the street isn't the answer. Now, all of a sudden, he's clean, trying to clean up the image of the state. Well, it's too late for 2024 mm -hmm. because, uh, for uh, for him to run, seriously run as vice president because we have video after video showing this issue in uh, California. However, back to the issue that I was a little talking about, where you now have these Democrats where they're really turning on their Jewish supporters you did genuinely seem to have Governor Shapiro of Pennsylvania interested in becoming governor. Uh, not governor. He's the right governor. He's, Vice president. Vice president. And you actually had CNN commentator saying, well, he's Jewish, so that's risky. This is where we are in 2024. I'm sorry, yep. but would CNN even say the same? I don't. I don't necessarily see the same thing. If we uh, were considering Rashida Tlaib, who, by the way, is Palestinian herself, 
I don't necessarily see CNN commenting and saying, well, that's risky because of Hamas. <laughs> and yeah, yet but- here we are with the two path of, well, we can't have a Jewish vice president. And, and that, that's kind of concerning, but this is how it kind of went, where it's like, well, okay, who do we get then? Oh, we'll just put in the governor of Minnesota, which, to be fair, for people who don't necessarily know much about Minnesota, because, you know, and I won't hold it against you Europeans, there's 50 American states, that's a lot for you to remember. Minnesota is somewhat of a swing state where... But at the same time, it's not worth a lot of electoral votes. You know, it's not like California, which is worth over 50, Texas that has 40, where if you win, you win a large part of the electoral college on your way to winning 270 electoral votes. Minnesota is a smaller state. So and the fact is of the matter is it's been leaning Democrat consistently in these elections. So. There isn't necessarily the sense that, oh, they definitely needed to nominate a politician from Minnesota or uh, they would lose Minnesota for the Electoral College. You're not necessarily seeing people as Minnesota as a a toss-up state. People are more focused on Arizona. Oh, and that was the other name that people are throwing out, which I have no idea why. It almost just seems like these, you know... I'm not trying to be offensive, but it did almost seem like, for whatever reason, some female voters are enamored with uh, Senator Kelly, who is uh, is also an American astronaut. Ooh, having an astronaut as vice president. Ooh, a man who is in outer space. Okay, but what's his success? You don't hear much about him as a senator, you know? He's already been senator for a while, and you don't necessarily hear about him and what his work is he never he didn't build a name for him much except for the fact that okay he's a senator who successfully helped flip a senate seat from republican to democrat in arizona which to be fair because he is current senator from arizona there's a lot more attention on arizona as a potential swing state in this election than minnesota so it potentially would have made more sense nominating him over the governor of Minnesota. But, and the, people try to say, oh, well, it's because he's from the Midwest, so this will help win the Midwest vote. Yeah. I'll be brutally honest. As someone from Illinois, sure, we're Midwest states, but I don't strongly identify with Minnesota. I'm not going to vote for him just because he's from the Midwest. It it almost becomes offensive with American politics that people just think that every voter votes based off of identity politics. Where, oh my god, they're from the Midwest, I have to vote for them. No, let's look at their policy. Let's look at what they're going to do. Right. And if we look at Waltz, a lot of people talk about how his state was one of the more harder hit economically because he went gung-ho into shutting down for the pandemic, which a lot of people criticize because, which rightfully so, it's like, well, wait a minute. You weren't really cracking down on violent rioters, but then you're going to crack down for the pandemic even in more rural areas that, and that was the issue that a lot of people were having that Rather than potentially looking at and saying, because the theory for a while was with social distancing, well, okay, but that makes more sense in the cities then. Why are you going to then roll out uh, heavy restrictions all over states then, rather than looking at independent areas of the state, which... Some politicians did, but not necessarily, where it just seemed like they were trying to apply their same restrictions over the entire state. And as a lot of people have mentioned that, some people are concerned with Waltz because looking at his own finances. The fact that he has no personal investments. He only has his pensions, him and his wife. <laughs> um... They sold their house for under market value 
before he uh, he moved into the governor mansion, which is bizarre because they lost money then on the house from what they could have gotten. So people are questioning his ability to make smart financial decisions, and this is who we're going to have as vice president then? Uh, you know what? Uh, for me, the Democratic Party uh, hasn't uh, hasn't been democratic uh, for for a long time, considering what you what you have said. But we should recognize that the Harris Wall's victory will um, would bring significant changes to the political landscape, uh, particularly with Kamala Harris becoming the first woman and person, uh, first first woman of color to hold the presidency. And the, the historic uh, milestone would likely energize progressive movements, both in the United States and I think globally, uh, for a pushing issue like uh, ra uh, racial justice, gender equality, and climate action to the to the forefront of the of the national. Agenda. That's what we're hearing, but at the same time, I don't necessarily believe that because I'm not seeing strong proposals from her. And that's the issue where a lot of people are assuming that this is going to happen if she gets elected, but it's like we're not necessarily hearing much from her in that regard. We see where she does very poorly when she isn't 100% aware of the issue, which, to be fair to her, it's hard to always be 100% informed. So I definitely would be supportive of a mm -hmm. candidate such as herself if she were to say, you know what, I need to get back to you on that. Let me come out with an official statement that's more informed. That's perfectly okay. Rather than just having a candidate who will just, because that's the issue with Trump where some, a lot of people don't like him because... Many times he will just blurt something out without thinking it through and thinking out how it sounds. But at the same time with her, instead of, you know, luckily, she's, it seems that she's been able to get a handle on her laughing. But for years, that's what she would do. Cackle instead of saying something such as, let me get back to you on that. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not an expert in American politics, but... Um... I think uh, uh, Harris Walt's administration might face you know, considerable challenges in unifying uh, 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 such a deeply and, and deeply polarized country. To be fair, to be fair to her, it's going to be the same for either side. Uh, I don't think it's going to necessarily be able to be unified. Um, you know, listen, everybody, this is going to be a topic for another podcast episode where yeah, we will right. talk about Britain. And the race wars we're essentially seeing there, where we're seeing, unfortunately, violence coming from mm -hmm. all sides. Uh, that's potentially a very, a very big risk in the United States as well. We see a very deeply divided uh, country, and neither side necessarily seems willing to try to bridge. You see politicians taking cheap shots and criticisms on either side. Um, you know, and that's the issue that people are talking about. Since we talked about Waltz, we'll talk a little too about J.D. Vance, the issue where what's hurting Trump right now is that what's what the key demographic that's really helping out Kamala Harris right now? Single, unmarried women with no children. And it doesn't help that J.D. Vance was very harsh with his comments. Uh, okay. basically uh, talking about, oh, cat ladies and criticizing them. Look, it's one thing to discuss uh, the issue of not having enough children would do on a nation. Now, but it's also... No, we had this this discussion in in Romania during uh, during the presidential election in in twenty fourteen, and uh, I'm sick of this. Well, I know. I just want to go into a little and say, you know, look, yeah, a lot of it too, which also just like in Romania too, I uh, and, and other European countries, from my own own knowledge, is that in the West. The governments need to do more themselves. We cannot blame women for not having children because, as women will rightfully point out, well, 
Right. It takes a man and a woman to make a baby. So why aren't we talking about men without children? And then the issue too is that a lot, it's similar to in the US where I will, you know, you will hear, I still will say it's a strong minority of people. Oh, absolutely. I don't want kids. There's too many uh, people on the planet. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, if you listen to them though, they will say, oh, I'd like to have one or two kids, but it's too expensive. How am I supposed to allow them to go to college? How am I supposed to raise them? How am I supposed to pay the rent still? And, the, you know, because as we're saying, home prices are increasing drastically, just like it is in Romania, just like it is in Europe. And governments are failing to address that. So it is very harsh of J.D. Vance to act like, oh, well, it's the fault of single cat ladies choosing to have cats instead of children. One, as many women who are single with cats have pointed out, yeah, but it's because of the cost. The fact that with cats, you know, compared to dog owners who will sometimes pay quite a bit for dogs, especially if you're getting a purebred German Shepherd or Golden Doodle, where you could pay hundreds or thousands of dollars, all, you will see how many uh, videos of women with cats joking about, oh, look at my uh, cute cat that I found in the dumpster for free. You know? So, and uh, as they pointed out, are you really going to try to tell me that having a cat is anywhere near the financial responsibility of a child? And part of the issue is in the U.S. is, you know, and to give kudos, you know, kudos to our university uh, in Naples that now you already have your degree mm -hmm. from. They do a lot more cost-saving measures than the American universities. American universities have intentionally been turned into all-inclusive resorts that someone would go to on vacation. The fact that you have these colossal gyms, uh, people living on campus and that. Well, if you look in Europe, most people go to the university that is closest to their house. Yeah. Or yeah. they will slum it and live in an apartment with other multiple growth college students where you're living in these old rundown apartments while in the U.S., oh, we have to construct these beautiful dormitories for students to live. Well, someone has to pay for that. And that, unfortunately, is raising the price of college well out of the grasp of many Americans. And the issue is, is that just like in Europe, the message keeps on getting pushed in the United States. Well, you need to go to college to be successful. And a lot of my generation, where they're very grateful, where uh, they were able to go to college based off of maybe being a racial minority or because of their lack of family income, where they were able to get generous scholarships from universities, a lot of them are panicking right now because they're saying, oh, my God, I won't be able to send my children to college, even though I was able to finally be the first person in my family yeah. to go. Because they're good at getting a, a lot of, you know, I've known several people who fit this group that I'm thinking of, where first uh, generation um, college graduates, but, th you know, they're being successful, they're get, uh, finding good careers, they're being, uh, they're able to keep their jobs where they're doing well, excelling at what uh, they study. They're not able to save up. Yeah. Over $100,000 per child to go to college, though. The cost of living crisis is out of control in the U.S. compared to Europe, at least in Italy, where I've seen prices fall at the grocery store. And we are still talking about social inclusion. Yes. So I got to admit, it does not look good for Republicans that have J.D. Vance trying to single-handedly blame single women, almost as if saying that they're selfish, that this is all their fault, when a lot of them are saying, how am I supposed to afford the American dream that we keep on pushing for in our society. And as people have made a comment that that was, that this is a big issue of choosing J.D. Vance because J.D. Vance is someone who is very big on the MAGA train, mm -hmm. which in reality, now that Kamala Harris is um, the nominee instead of Biden, J.D. Vance is a much worse pick because J.D. Vance was a good pick against Biden where it's like, okay, let's crush him. But now with Kamala Harris, they definitely should have had nominee of someone who was more towards the middle, someone who could gain those moderate Democrats, someone who could gain those independents rather than someone who is mega, mega, mega and up. Oh, screw you, cat ladies. 
you're uh, the reason why America doesn't have enough children. Come on. Yeah. Uh, and that's the issue where, yes, some Americans are choosing not to have kids, but a lot of Americans are choosing not to have kids because uh, it's hard to do so in the current economy is because I know for a fact, uh, reflecting on Italy, since that's where our uh, PhD degrees, your came from, mine will come from. According to ISTAT, the National Statistical Office, yeah. most Italian, most young Italians would like to have about two children, which by the way, would be perfect for population replacement because it would be young people essentially replacing themselves right. to keep a uh, stable population. But as they're pointing out, they can't do that because of how expensive it's getting. And that's, it's the case in the U S too, because I do know a lot of people who young pe people who are talking about that, where uh, they would like to have kids, but it's getting so expensive to so do fast. so. I mean, you're looking at neighborhoods in Chicago, where I'm from. And I'll, you know, I don't know about Europeans. You tell me uh, if this is a thing that young uh, Europeans do. But definitely young Americans, we will like to look at different houses on real estate websites. Yeah. And we're looking at them and saying, oh my gosh, this is out of my grasp looking at neighborhoods that for the longest time have been considered working class, middle class in Chicago, mm -hmm. these houses or apart or condos are going for over or just under half a million dollars. Yes, Americans get paid more on average than Romanians or Italians, etc. But right. the average American is not getting paid enough to buy a half a million dollar house and then be able to save up over a hundred thousand dollars per child to go to college. And that's what people are saying. Well, there's some things that you could still do, such as go to community college, which yeah. is a cheaper option for the first two years, but let's not get it twisted. A lot of these community colleges could still cost you thousands of dollars a year for the first two years. So I it's totally agree with you. a costly investment. But part of the, you know, but part of the issue is I don't know what America could do now because we would have to drastically cut back on college campuses, which I don't know if they would want to do. Because, for example, as you know, in Europe, very few universities have an American style campus. Most Amer uh, European universities, it is buildings spread throughout the city where the universities are only responsible for those buildings. In the United States, such as my alma mater, they are responsible for square kilometer after square kilometer of land that they have to uh, landscape and maintain. While European universities, they're only financially responsible for the buildings themselves, which helps them uh, cut down on the cost. For yeah. example, my alma mater spent over $80 million to build two gyms on campus. That is unthinkable for an, a European university to spend that much. That much, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, but at the same time, who pays that? Students on, and it's raising the cost of crisis. But yeah, we'll move on from this topic. I know. Yeah, it but, is. It is clear for me that uh, we can discuss a lot about uh, social inclusion, uh, social politics in the U.S. Because we really need to understand uh, to understand what what's happening and what will happen. With the with the social politics um, uh, across the ocean, but as we wrap up this episode, uh, it is clear uh, for me, and I think that uh, for our friends too, that Harris Wall's victory could could mark uh, a, a transformative moment in uh, in American politics, with uh, with the potential to 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 share a new era of of leadership focus on uh, e inclusivity, progressive politics, and uh, and digital savvy communication, and and so on, as you said. But however. Uh, the challenges of uh, of governing a polarized nation remain uh, remain significant, and the success of this potential administration will depend on its ability to to. I just to want to comment it. real quick on that. A lot of people are sometimes critical of that because a lot mm -hmm. of Black Americans will 
be honest and say they expected more from under Obama, where they expected to see their position in the U.S. increase, but then be able to build more wealth, et cetera. And if we're being honest, we didn't necessarily see Black Americans be able to make a big leap forward under Obama. So it almost seems like it might be wishful thinking under Harris, especially with the issue that she's not bringing forth these big policy decisions. That, okay, well, Obama wasn't necessarily uh, uh, successful. This is what I'm going to do in order to improve different markers in Black American communities. How am I going to make it safer? How am I going to help Black Americans uh, close the wealth gap? We're not hearing any of that. And yeah. so the issue is we almost expect that this is going to come about because uh, she's part Black, but it's not necessarily true. And then, okay, and then that also, uh, just to bring up real quick, since we start talking a little bit about race, this is what's hurting the Republicans a lot. The fact that, yes, one of the issues with Kamala Harris is that instead of calling herself biracial, she will go all in on a racial identity as she has uh, before, where when she was winning in California, oh, well, she's the first Indian American, completely mm -hmm. disregarding uh, being Black. And now all of a sudden, because it's more beneficial for presidency, oh, I'm, a, uh, I'm Black. But at the same time, I definitely have to agree that Republicans wasted so much time. And, they, you know, it, I, I almost wish where it's like, gosh, uh, hello, could they give me a job and I could be a strategist? Why are you focusing on that? When a lot of Americans want to hear, how are you going to let, make my life better? Because a lot of Americans, they will do different interviews and different Americans feel that they are worse off economically under Biden than Trump. Yet you're not hearing Republicans talking about, well, how are we going to improve the economy once again? How are we going to help people uh, save for college for their children, be able to afford to have children? Now you're having these G uh, GOP strategists obsessing about Kamala Harris's race. And it's just a losing strategy because if you talk too much about her race, you almost make it seem like, well, okay, is it an issue for you to have a black female uh, president? I agree. Focus on the policy issues. It's one thing where you can make a comment or two and say, well, why does she flip flop? But don't obsess over it, which for weeks we almost saw this obsession. And it's like, this isn't the issue that a lot of people care about right, right. now. Focus on the economy, focus on the border. Focus yeah, on they, how they should put an end to, to, to this discussion about race. It's it's clear. And it's clear for me that, that the road ahead it's it, it's filled with both opportunities and, and obstacles for for the next uh, US president. Um, well that's why I gotta be honest. Um, you know, it'll be interesting to see how this election plays out because both sides are bombing big time where yeah. both sides are not necessarily running a very successful campaign. So it'll be interesting to see how this election turns out. But I got to admit, <laughs> for anyone not aware about how we elect president in the United States, it's driving me nuts, these popular vote polls, mm -hmm. where they'll say, oh, well, she's one person ahead of Trump right now. That's not how the presidency is decided. It's decided right. based off of the electoral vote. So why are we focusing on the percentage? We should be focus focusing on, okay, let's do the polls in the individual states. And then you could see based off, well, okay, based off of these polls, uh, this candidate will win um, Ohio, which for a while was a swing state. Now it's definitely moved towards the right. Same with Florida. Well, okay, who's going to win Wisconsin and Michigan? Who's going to win Nevada? Who's going to win uh, Minnesota? That's what we should be focusing more on rather than, oh, well, who, uh, <laughs> who's leading the popular leading, vote? Well, the popular yeah. vote doesn't decide it. The popular vote could decide it in each state uh, on who gets electoral vote. So whoever wins the most votes in Illinois will then win Illinois, but it, it's just bizarre. And I don't know. It's just the sad thing is 
to be brutally, brutally honest, uh, with the choices of the vice presidencies, the fact that um, a political analyst, uh, Chuck Todd, I do agree with him, that he was pointing out that it looks like with this vice presidency pick, um, she was more leaning more towards the far left rather than someone more moderate. Mm -hmm. And then the fact with J.D. Vance, where he's definitely more someone who's definitely much more conservative, someone who's more mega supporting rather than someone who could have been more reaching out towards moderates. It's going to be difficult to really say how this election is going to go. And right. both campaigns aren't necessarily doing very well. I just got to throw out one thing about, uh, in case Europeans didn't see it, it was funny that AOC, probably the most infamous member of the squad in the house, she was trying to say JD Vance was weird or as it's called in the US, man spreading. He's sitting on a couch alone, so his blades are a little apart instead of cross, which I'll be brutally honest with you, many men do not cross their legs for a certain reason. Uh, we'll leave that to the viewers to realize what that reason is. It was yeah. funny because, you know, she wasn't wearing a dress or anything, so it didn't matter. She was wearing a, uh, a pants. AOC was sitting with her legs spr uh, spread apart like a man. So it's like, how are you going to say JD Vance is weird? Would you do the same thing at your own events? Right. And, but that just shows to show you. These politicians on either side are trying to get these cheap aha moments rather than focusing policy. And it's not doing any good because part of the issue is too is that politicians, regardless whether they're from different political parties, should try to work together. If you're going to make comments about how someone sits and that and just these bizarre comments, are you going to be a politician that people want to work with? No, the other side's going to be pissed with you and say, I don't want to work with them. They uh, they focus on the petty aspects. They're, they don't focus on working together, making compromises, trying to uh, pass legislation that will benefit Americans. Well, we're basically, uh, we're the, uh, I don't know how many uh, Europeans know about Real Housewives, the TV shows. The TV. Mm -hmm. Which, possibly, now the fact that Germany is getting their own Real Housewives of Munich. <laughs> Anyways, a lot of it is just these petty drama with these wealthy women. That's basically how you see all these politicians, male or female, Democrat or Republican, acting for years now in the U.S. politics, which is to our detriment. Well, he sits funny. Well, they do this. Are you serious? This is what we're going to focus on rather than vote for me because of these policy decisions. Well, this politician believes in that. Instead, well, they well, they sit weird. <laughs> right. And we will uh, look uh, much closer to what will happen uh, during this campaign. Oh, yeah. Uh, we will talk more uh, during a podcast episode yeah, discussing right. the DNC. Because right. Because that will be definitely be of a lot of attention because a lot of people are nervous that yeah, it's going to be we, a, we a very dangerous uh, convention because you're having so many groups talking about how they're going to protest. And a lot of these groups that are talking about potentially protesting are right. not simply ones who are going to be peacefully protesting, having their signs, raising their voice, which to be brutally honest with you, you know, because they probably, you know, if they applied for a permit and whatever, okay, that's 100% legal. You could scream your head off. Uh, you have freedom of speech as long as you're not threatening the lives of a search uh, of different people. Well, that enters criminal territory. You can't yeah. make threats. You can't raise panic. But with freedom of speech, we do have a lot of freedom. So people can absolutely peacefully protest. But the issue is that people are bringing up some of the groups who are going to be present at the DNC are not known for peaceful protesting. Right. Uh, thank you very much, Nick, uh, for, for, this, for this discussion. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you, too, for joining us. We hope uh, you have enjoyed our, um, our exploration of what the Harris World administration could, uh, could mean for, for the U.S. and, uh, and beyond. 
Uh, please don't forget to follow us on uh, social media for updates, behind the scenes content and more in deep uh, analysis of the of the issues that matter most. Please if you made it to the people. end. Put some emojis in to see what you say. So if you prefer uh, Trump, put an orange uh, emoji in the chat. If you prefer Kamala, put a black woman in the chat. Right. <laughs> and don't forget to stay connect with, uh, with us, with the EU Spectator. And uh, follow the YouTube security. channel, turn on that notification bell. Follow us on YouTube, follow us on Twitter. X, it's now called. Yeah, and, and and be sure that uh, that uh, be, be sure to tune in for for our next uh, for our next episode of of the podcast. Thank you very much, Nick, for for the discussion. Thank you.